Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Welcome to our Wednesday night gospel explosion, pastoral teachings. We thank God for you joining us on tonight. We do honor God, who is sovereign and supreme, to his son, Jesus Christ, who is Savior and Lord, to the Holy Spirit, who is our comforter, our leader, our teacher, and our guide. And to each of you in your respective places, we greet you with Jesus' joy and in divine love. And again, we thank you for sharing with us on tonight. Tonight, we'd like to call your attention to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 39. Genesis chapter 39, and we'll begin reading at verse 7. That's Genesis 39 and 7. You will find these words recorded. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph and she said, lie with me. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, behold, my master wanteth a nose not what is with me in the house and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in his house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And it came to pass as she spake to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. Verse 11, and it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business or to do his work. And there was none of the men of the house there within. And she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you now for this privilege and this opportunity to come together on tonight. We thank you for your grace and your mercy that has brought us and kept us and never left us. We invite you in our midst tonight that you, that you would touch us, touch our hearts, minds, souls, and spirits, that we might hear what the Spirit is saying to us on tonight. In advance, we give you all the honor, the glory, and the praise for us in Jesus' name that we pray. And every heart said, Amen. And tonight, we want to speak from these words. Beware of temptation. Beware of temptation. Beware simply means to take heed, to watch, to observe, to be on guard. Temptation means enticement, persuasion, seduction, testing, and proving. My brothers and sisters, I believe that we're living in an age where we have to make sure that we are watchful and observing of the things that's happening around us during this day and time. Presently, we are tempted in so many, many ways. Social media, spam calls, televisions, telemarketers, polit political le leaders, and even some Christian leaders are tempting us to do some things that we should not and would not normally do. So regardless of how the temptation comes, 
what it has wrapped itself in. I want to remind us and even perhaps suggest to us that we need to make sure that we are aware of what's going on around us. First Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13 says, there have no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear the temptation. So I want to encourage us and even warn us as Christians, as children of God, to beware of temptation. Watch those pretenders, those who pretend to be what they are not. I believe, my brothers and sisters, that when God blesses his people, the devil begins to set traps so that the people of God will squander their blessings. In other words, after triumph comes trouble. After the calm comes the storm. After the victory comes the villain. After trustworthiness comes temptation. This chapter, chapter 39 of Genesis, gives us one of the most instructive lessons on temptation found in the Bible. After studying this text, I discovered that from the conduct of Potiphar's wife, we can learn about some of the ways of being tempted or temptation. From the increasing numbers of the increasing number of confused and wrecked lives in our churches today, let alone in the world, my brothers and sisters, it is apparent that we need to be aware of temptation. As I look closely at the text, the first thing I discovered about this temptation was this temptation was visual. Look at verse 7, the A clause of chapter 39 of Genesis. It says, and it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph. So the first thing I want us to notice about this temptation, that it was visual. Now, Joseph, according to the Bible, was a handsome man. If you look at verse six, the A clause, it'll let us know that. Listen what it says. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not aught he had save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly or handsome person and well favored. Yes, my brothers and sisters, Joseph was a handsome man. And Potiphar's wife allowed her eyes to dwell upon his handsomeness. Saints, listen carefully. One of the most effective approaches of sin is through the eye gate. The devil knows this and he exploits it. It is the history of of sin. Why do I say that? Well, in the book of Genesis, Genesis 3 and 6 says Eve saw that the tree was good for food. 
Genesis 6 and 2 says, the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. 2 Samuel chapter 11 verse 2 says, David saw a woman taking a bath. These persons all fell into grievous sin because they did not guard the eye gate. They let their eyes feast it on the forbidden. And many times in life, we have the tendency to let our eyes feast on the forbidden. Many still ruin their lives because they do not guard the eye gate. And there is plenty, my brothers and sisters, to guard the eye gate from in this day and time. In the 21st century, there is so much that we need to guard the eye gate from. For instance, TV, movies, videos, internet, Facebook, all of these things, we have to make sure that we guide the eye gate from because they are there to entice us or tempt us. Yes, so the first thing I noticed about this temptation in the text was it was visual. The second thing I noticed about this temptation was this temptation was also versatile. You see, I found out that evil is versatile. In other words, if the devil can't seduce you one way, he will try another. If he can't tempt you or entice you one way, he will try another way. Before the temptation from Potiphar's wife, Joseph had been tempted in the area of despair in chapter 37. But the temptation from Potiphar's wife was in the area of delight. Are you following me? Delight in physical pleasures. You see, if pain does not defeat you, the devil or the tempter will try pleasure. Persecution from the world has not hurt the attendance of the church as sports have. Uh-huh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, persecution from the church has not hurt the church like popularity have. The sword has not hurt the church like sports have. It, it's amazing to me that in the 21st century, sports has actually taken over everything. Everybody's involved in sports. So now they have sports 24-7. Um, uh, or they did before God allowed this pandemic to come and just shut everything down. Now they're wondering when we're going to get back to sports. And they're almost, uh, people almost, ha uh, almost are having a, a, a fits or a heart attack because there's no sports. See, see, the sports has taken over or has hindered church attendance. And because temptation is versatile, we must guard every facet of our lives from evil. In other words, we must put on the whole armor of God so we can withstand in these evil days. So we see here now that <clears throat> the temptation was visual. The temptation was versatile. But I also noticed that this temptation was dignified. 
Yes. You see, evil loves to cloak itself in the apparel of high position, respectability, and status. So, verse 7 says, it was the master's wife who advocated the dirty deed. The master's wife. Now, can you imagine how this would strengthen the appeal of temptation? The master's wife. You see, if another slave had tempted Joseph, remember Joseph was a slave in Potiphar's house. If another slave had tempted Joseph, it would have been much easy or easier to turn down. But coming from the master's wife, coming from the master's wife made it sound more permissible acceptable, and even safe. But all of this is simply a deceptive feature of temptation. You see, my brothers and sisters, sin is sin. Whether it is advocated by the bum on skid row or by the prince, in the palace. So much evil is dressed up today in dignity. Yes, haven't you witnessed the commercials on TV? They could be talking about uh, selling mechanical tools, but in the midst of that commercial, there is a young lady uh, with a bikini on advertising mechanical tools. TV dirt. Everything you see, there's something to tempt you or to entice you to do something that you need not to do. You see, the devil... Y'all do know him. The devil is a master at sophisticating sin and dignifying defilement. Did you get that? He's a master at it. Beware of such false advertising. The temptation was dignified. It was versatile. It was visual. Also, fourthly, I notice that the temptation in this text was timely. Yes, skillful timing adds to the effectiveness of temptation. In Joseph's case, the clever timing of temptation is seen in at least two ways. First, I discovered that it came during a time of success. This temptation came to Joseph during a time when Joseph was successful. Joseph had experienced much success in his work for Potiphar. How do I know that? Well, let's go back to verse 3 of chapter 39. Listen what it says. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, with Joseph, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. You see that? Uh-huh. It says he was prosperous in all of his work. Verse 4 says 
he was promoted to oversee, uh, to be the overseer over Potiphar's house. Verse 6 says, he was well favored. But then here comes verse 7. Verse 7 says, after these things, Joseph was tempted. After Joseph was very successful, he was tempted. You see, the tempter, he, he knows when to strike. He knows when to confront you. And one of the most vulnerable times for yielding to temptation is after one has been successful. Because we have the tendency to take our guards down. Success can go to our head, puff us up, and therefore soften us to evil and make us easy victims for temptation. This example in the Bible, King Uzziah, King Uzziah became the king uh, and then he uh, had the audacity to go into the temple and, want, and, and began to do priestly duties because he had become successful as a king, so he decided that he can go into the temple and, and act like uh, uh, to take on the priestly duties. Listen, my brothers and sisters, I'm not saying that success is evil because success is not evil in itself and can be a result of God's blessings upon us. But we must be very cautious after success, after we have become su successful, be cautious unless we become a victim of temptation. Give an example. Being successful we got promotion on our job. We got a new salary, We're making a lot of money. And then someone calls on the phone and says, you know, if you um, give me your bank account, uh, we're going to drop a couple of million dollars in the bank. And because you've been so successful on your job, so you think that's a good idea. Well, I got money I can, I can, I can spare. And you fall into that temptation. And the next thing you know that you, your bank account is down to zero. So we must be very cautious after we become successful that we don't become a victim of temptation. So, secondly, the clever timing of temptation, although it came uh, in during a time of success, but this temptation also, watch this, came in a time of secrecy. This timing is seen in the last attempt of Potiphar's wife to seduce or entice Joseph. Let's look at verse 11. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business or to do his work and there was none of the men of the house there within. Time of secrecy. You see what happens, or what happened is that Potiphar's wife waited until no one was around. Then she attacked. 
She tried to use the advantage of secrecy to encourage sinful conduct. Are you with me? You see, she understood and she realized that many will do in private what they will not do in public. And the tempter knows this. She, she, she believed that, 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 that if she just get in, in private, that, that he would succumb to what she wanted him to do. When Joseph saw the peril of privacy, of privacy he fled. In other words, he got out of Dodge. So now we see in this temptation of Potiphar's wife upon Joseph, the temptation was visual. The temptation was versatile. The temptation was dignified. It was timely during the time of Joseph's success, during the time of secrecy when nobody was there but Potiphar's wife and Joseph. Now, the fifth thing I noticed about this temptation was this temptation was also persistent. Usually, temptation is persistent. It's in the text, verse 10. Listen what it says. And it came to pass as she spake to Joseph day by day that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. Wow. My brothers and sisters, evil does not give up easily. The tempters do not give up easily. Evil is so persistent and oftentimes it is the persistency of evil that defeats us because it just keeps coming and we throw in the towel. Listen, we must never let down our God. We should always keep our guards up. We must never conclude that once we have conquered a temptation, it will not bother us again. In Luke chapter 4, I remember Jesus was tempted by the devil. You remember that? And he was tempted by the devil when he was in the wilderness, Jesus' experience in the wilderness. He was attempted by the devil. The devil tried to tempt him in, 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 in some ways and Jesus didn't allow the devil to tempt him. But the text says in Luke chapter 4 that the devil departed from him for a season. That means that the tempter, the devil, the evil one or the evil ones, they are persistent. They will keep coming. They will keep calling. They'll keep trying to get you to buy that 10 acres of land in Utah. The sixth thing I noticed about this, this temptation was it was deceitful. It was visual. It was versatile. It was dignified. It was timely. It was persistent, but it was also deceitful. Look at the last clause of verse 10.
He hearkened not. He hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. Hmm. Evil can be very deceitful. Temptation can be very deceitful. It is subtle and sneaky. And as a result, it often deceives the innocent ones. Now, Potiphar's wife, she was a clever chick. You see, when Joseph would not yield to her first proposal, guess what? She modified it. If he would not lie with her, then she would ask him to just lie by her. If he will not lie by her, then she would ask him to just keep company with her. You see how deceitful temptation is? This deceitful tactic of evil is the subtle scheme of sinful compromise, which has slain many of thousands. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. Because I have witnessed that it is the argument of a backslidden saint or backslidden saints who want to defend their dating of unsaved people. Haven't you heard that many times uh, that, you know, uh, saints want to justify or defend why they date unsaved folk? They say they will not marry the unsaved but only intend to date them or they say they are dating the unsaved so they can witness to them. Saints, compromising in the area of right and wrong always end up in corruption. Take that chance if you want to. I've heard many people say, well, you know, I'm going to date him or even marry him because I'll change him or I'll change her. Well, you can't change yourself. How are you going to change somebody else? You see, evil is no, is no give and take gain. It is all take. Evil is all take. Temptation is all take. Potiphar's wife had as her goal an immoral act. There are many people out there today, especially since uh, e the economy has, has gotten bad and things have gotten bad. There are many people out there trying to tempt you to do something so that they can get over on you. And many of us, we are not protected. So I'm saying to us tonight is to beware of temptation, however it comes. In the text, it came uh, in uh, Potiphar's wife unto Joseph to seduce him to lie with her. But temptation comes in all forms, all ways. So now, Potiphar wife wanted to have an immoral act with Joseph. And changing, watch this, and changing the request from lie with to lie by 
to be with was simply a disguise to camouflage the fact that the first request was still her main objective. And that's the way the tempters operate. So I've shared with you so far six things <clears throat> in this temptation. The temptation was visual. It was versatile. It was dignified. It was timely. It was persistent. And it was also, last but not least, this temptation was aggressive. The seventh thing, aggressive. Look at verse 12. We're in Genesis chapter 39, verse 12. And she caught him by his garment, saying, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out or got himself out. Wow. Listen, from the very beginning of the evil solicitation of Potiphar's wife, Joseph would feel the pressure of temptation. Why do I say that? Because Joseph was a godly man. Joseph believed God and he worshiped God and he served God. So even in the, from the beginning of, of Potiphar's wife, evil solicitation, I believe Joseph felt the pressure of the temptation and saints, many of us, before we uh, yield to temptation. We feel the pressure of temptation. So, because he felt the pressure of the temptation, he was able to yield not. But in verse 12, the greatest pressure came when she caught him by his garment. She caught him. She had asked him previously uh, to, to, to lie with her in verse 7. But this time, she grabbed him. She caught him by his garment and said, look here, bro, lie with me. At this point, at this time, she would put so much pressure on Joseph that he would have to fall or flee. He would have to lie or leave. Fortunately for Joseph, he fled. He left. The text says that he left his garment in her hand, fled and got him out. My brothers and sisters, you got to be aware of temptation. You got to watch those people out there who are pretending to be someone who they're not. You got to watch the pretenders. Joseph Watch this. Gave up his coat before he would give up his character. Joseph gave up a moment of pleasure before he would give up his purpose. I'm going to let that sink in a little bit. My brothers and sisters, Evil temptation is not content to simply give 
passive solicitations. It can become very aggressive. They call you on the phone and want you to give them your credit card information. You hang up, they call right back. They use another number. They call again. They'll tell you that you got $2 million waiting on you in the bank. What do I need to do? Well, you need to give me your bank account. Well, no, if you got $2 million, you give me the $2 million. I had a situation when they called me one time and said, we got $2 million and what we need in order for you to get this $2 million, you need to send me $500. I said, well, if you got $2 million, just take $500 out of the $2 million that you're going to send me. We have to beware of temptation. It can become very aggressive in trying to corrupt the innocent ones. It will put so much pressure on the tempted that they will think they have to yield to that temptation. They don't give up. They're persistent, but they're also aggressive. You see, the aggressiveness of evil comes in many, many forms. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it is simply the pressure of adverse circumstances. Other times it is peer pressure. And there are times when it is the law of the land that pressures us to do evil. My, aren't we facing some of that today? They're trying to change the laws and the rules of the land to pressure us to do evil or to tempt us to do evil. But my brothers and my sisters, whatever form it comes in, it endeavors to make the tempted believe that they have to give in to evil or to wrong or to sin. And so many try to justify their wrongdoing on the basis that they have no other choice. That's what's happening in our nation today when it comes down to police brutality in the black neighborhood. They're just saying and lying and saying they have no other choice to do what they do. To shoot people seven times, ten times. To kneel on someone's neck for almost nine minutes. They're wrong and they know they're wrong, but they say that they had or they have no other choice. They try to justify their wrong. Some even say that they do what they do because if they don't do it, they will lose their position, their prestige, and their power. Some say they will lose their job. Some say, you've heard them, I lose my job if I don't drink at the business parties. Some say they will lose their job if they don't falsify reports. Some say they will not get reelected if they don't lie and cheat and steal. Others say they must do some evil because every 
one else is doing evil. And it's the only way to get along in life. But my brothers and sisters, all such arguments do not justify sin and evil. Never do we have to do evil. Never do we have to sin. We just don't have to. Therefore, if we don't have to, let us be like Joseph. We don't have to get caught up in or we don't have to yield to the temptation that has the tendency to look good, smell good, and perhaps even taste good, but it's not good. We can learn a lesson from Joseph tonight because Joseph was able to overcome his temptation. Why was that? He was able to overcome his temptation because, first of all, he was decisive. In verse 8, he refused. In verse 10, he hearkened not. He refused Potiphar's wife. He hearkened not unto Potiphar's wife. And in verse 12, he left his garment and fled. Joseph made a decision not to yield to temptation. Not only was Joseph able to overcome his temptation because he was decisive, but also because he was discerning. In other words, Joseph viewed sin as God viewed sin. Joseph realized that he couldn't take a chance in, 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 in yielding to the temptation of Potiphar's wife because if he did, he would sin against God. Now I know some of the things that we may have been tempted to do may not be as severe as Joseph's situation and may not cause us to sin against God. But if we are attempted to do something that we know is not right, then it may not be a sin against God, but it will cause us havoc, will cause us hurt, will cause us pain, will cause us problem. So that's why I want to suggest to us tonight to be aware of temptation, however form it comes in, be aware. Where it causes you to lose your house or lose your bank account or lose your relationship with God, whatever it is, be aware because the tempters are out there. And if the, the, the tempter tempted Jesus, what do you think about you and I? So as I conclude tonight, Remember, never do we have to sin or do evil. Therefore, yield not to the pressure of temptation. It may be something that perhaps you don't even call sin or evil, but it can cause you trouble, and terror. So, yield not to the pressure of temptation. Somebody's pressuring you to do something and say you gotta do it. Yield not. For the hymn writer wrote it this way. Yield not to temptation. For yielding is sin. Each victory will help you 
some others to win. Fight manfully onward. Dog passions subdue. Look ever to Jesus. He'll carry you through. Ask the Savior to help you. Comfort, strengthen, and keep you. He is willing to aid you. He will carry you through. My brothers, be aware of temptation. Is going to get worse before it gets better. So be on God. Keep your eyes open. Be aware. Watch. Observe what's happening all around you. And when the burdens get heavy. When hill seems too hard to climb, take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. When you are tempted to do things that you know is not right to do, I believe if you use that telephone that is within your bosom, in other words, if you just ring him up from your heart, you don't need Sprint, you don't need AT&T, you don't need Verizon. All you need to do is call him up and tell him what you want. He is a protector. He is a preserver. He has an all-seeing eye. He knows everything. He has all power. He's everywhere. So you 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 got somebody that can protect you even in the midst of of all the chaos that perhaps we are facing. The Bible teaches us to watch and pray. That lets me know that we have to be aware of what's going on and also pray and talk to God about what's going on and listen to God as he talk back to us. I don't know how you feel about it, but I'm thankful tonight that when I'm tempted by the evil one, I can say like Jesus said in the wilderness, get thee behind me, Satan. Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. What you need to do when you are facing temptation in your life, put the word of God on that temptation. You will win every time. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for allowing us this privilege tonight to come together. We thank you for your word tonight as you remind us to be to beware of temptation. To be aware of those things that are sinful and evil that will confront us on this journey from earth to heaven. We pray now, God, that you will let this word tonight sink deeply to our hearts and minds and our spirits. And when we are attempted or enticed by the evil one, that we can do like Joseph. We can yield not. We can flee from the tempter and the temptation. We thank you 
for what you have allowed us to experience. Keep on blessing us as we keep on carrying your word, telling men and women to flee from the wrath to come. The wages of sin is death and the gift of God is eternal life. We thank you for all things. This is our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're listening or watching and you're not saved, we want to give an invitation to be saved. If you actually are looking for a church connection, we'll invite you uh, to make that decision tonight. If you're not saved, uh, God is willing to save you and he can save you right where you are. If you need to uh, reconnect to the church, you need to rededicate your life. He is standing waiting on you. If you're not saved, if you just pray this prayer with me, Lord, I'm a sinner. I need to be saved. Forgive me for my sins. Come into my heart and make me a new creation. I believe that you are the son of God. You died for my sins and God raised you for my redemption. If you prayed that prayer tonight, you are saved. The word of God says, He's that, he that calleth upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if you believe that you're saved, then I want to encourage you to join some Bible teaching church where you can learn and grow and become a mature Christian. You can call the Innovation Baptist Church or connect with us on our website, innovationbaptistchurch.org. Or you can call our church phone line if you need any help uh, with uh, your salvation, with your rededication, whatever you need. Uh, please give us a call. God bless you. May God keep you. Certainly is our prayer. We thank each of you for sharing with us tonight. We want to um, encourage you. If you need a replay of this message, you can log on to our website, innovationbaptistchurch.org, and you can uh, watch the replay, or you can send it to someone else who may need uh, this word on tonight. All right, we'll see you, you all again on uh, Sunday for our Sunday morning worship experience, worship in the word, 9.30 a.m. on Sunday morning. God bless you. May God keep you is our prayer. <laughs>